Brother Matt said we meet together with the understanding our need for one another in the context of our assembly. I like that. Um, it's my, my intention tonight at this part of the service just to kind of pick it up where we left off this morning. Uh, it reminds me of a relay race or relay runners. You know, they run and, and, they, and they're, 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 their whole goal is to pass that baton off to the next person. And the, the worst thing can ever happen on the tra- if you've been at the track is to drop that thing. Yeah. So you've got to make sure that, you, that he gets it in his hand because he's looking ahead, he's running, his hand's back here, and you've got to make sure it's in his hand before you turn it loose. We're not dealing with ideologies and abstracts, but we're dealing with the truth. So what we'll do is we want to pass this thing off to one another. And um, that's what we want to proceed tonight. God is well pleased, brother, when we study the scriptures, the record He has given of us to us, and uh, in the chat in the same uh, in the same letter, chapter ten, uh, Paul says that these things were written for our, our admonition, yes, right. written for those for whom the end of the ages have come. Well, this we're in that same time period that Paul wrote these things. We're in that we're in that that time uh, where these things have were written. We, this is the period of time when the conclusion will take, of all things will take place. This is the last day. And uh, so this is a scripture, and I want you to, as we proceed, I want you to think about it. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Amen. Amen. So, Antonio read our scripture, so we don't need to read that again. But the title of this is To God's Church. Now, it's, Paul wrote this to God's church and to the church which is at Corinth. Now, brethren, Paul didn't write this letter to a building. We know that. So when we say the church, we know it can't be the building. We'll just say that right off. So, uh, Paul, he didn't write it to the Baptist church. He didn't write it to the Presbyterian church. He didn't write it to the Christian church, the Churches of Christ. He didn't write it to 50,000 other groups around the world. The letter was written before any of these groups were thought of. Even though everyone who gathers here in Corinth will either read this letter or have it read to them, what Paul Paul says tonight was meant for the church of God. And those of God, well, they will welcome this letter. They'll receive this letter. This is in contrast to those, all those who are outside of God. Because, you know, when the flesh reads these scriptures, uh, Corinthians, mostly they're ignored. They'll just read them as an introduction. But see, now Paul, could have, he could have picked it up down here in the ninth or 10th verse. He could have went right in to the problem with division. But see, he didn't. He addressed the, and there were there were reasons why Paul said these things that he did. That's why we want to we want to focus on this. Um, and now the flesh just can't receive these kind of things. They just they kind of like skim over them and gloss over them. And it it just counts for the world's alienation from God. You understand? Uh, and the most basic things. Uh, you know, I thought it was interesting to notice that unto the church of God. Uh, this phrase is exclusive to the first and second letter of Corinthians. You may already know this. Uh, you know, he used it here in the first letter, used it in the second letter, and he doesn't use it again in any of his writings. I thought it was particularly interesting considering the occasions from, uh, and the problems and things that he'll be addressing with this group, that he would, he would address them unto the church of God, and that he would confirm God to them in this way. In this same verse, he will tell us who are the church of God unto the church, to them, those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord, uh, both theirs and ours. Now, if Paul was to walk into any of our uh, brother, what I call the brotherhood of the Christian church, Church of Christ, and he was to present this message to them, he would not be received today. Uh, but, uh, but the truth is that there is a one body of Christ. There's only one church of God. And they are the same. And Paul had a profa- profound care for her. No matter where they were gathered together, uh, no matter where the church was assembled, uh, they make up the body of Christ. Our unity is not dependent on men, 
but is maintained in the Spirit of God. So wherever did the brethren meet, you see, there's perfect unity in the Lord. The church of God is scattered all over this earth. You know this, brethren. But it's still the one people of God. We find that this letter is addressed to all of them, each and every one of them, written to those in Corinth who belong to God. Now this same letter is, is written to everyone that call upon the name of the Lord, both theirs and ours. Paul doesn't waste any time. He gets right to the point. He reminds the Corinthians who they are in Christ Jesus. Now, saints. The word saint equals holy. It's the same word. But then you already know that, don't you? But then I understand that you look about in, this, in, our, in our age and we look about that there's a whole lot of difference in understanding this and, and that of being and doing, you see. So call to be whole, uh, call to be holy, call by God to be holy. They are holy because it's God who sanctifies them, you see. God is behind this work. That is, it's God who makes a man holy. And he's, he's a, he, uh, God is one who can make, uh, by nature, those who are unholy, holy. One time we were in darkness, but now we're in light. One time we were ignorant, but now we're enlightened, you see. The word sanctifies also expresses separation, as Paul has put the word to use here. Yes. Uh, it's a separation unto holiness. It's not just enough to be separated. Back in Paul's day, there was a lot of separation. There was uh, men who had separated themselves into the pagan priest and, and all kind of duties. They, they had separated themselves, but now Paul uses this word exclusively to pick up that God has the idea of holiness, that God has separate, separated men unto holiness, he, uh, which is sanctification. Men separate for many different reasons. Rather, uh, men are actually pretty good at separating. Uh, they're uh, experts at it. They will separate off in their own little uh, groups with, for, for no reason at all, nearly. But our God, He separates the people unto holiness. Amen. And in fact, those who would count themselves as holy... They have been separated un, from unholiness and have been by being put into His one who is holy, Christ Jesus. He is the place of holiness, and He is the one in whom we have been placed, sanctified in Christ. Now, this took place, brethren, when we were born again, as you as you recall, when we were quickened together with Christ, born of the Spirit, and to newness of life, that we may serve God and not this world. Uh, there's two distinct things to see in this. It says God who has called us unto holiness, and it is Christ in whom we have been made holy. Paul states it this way, unto the church of God, sanctified in Christ Jesus. Well, either way, it's clearly not of men. Neither the calling nor the sanctification. It's all of God through Christ Jesus. And this becomes our common association with one another. That we've, we've all been separated and we've all been sanctified by faith and received of God. And we've been called for that reason, for sanctification. And it was for the sanctification of the people of God that Christ Jesus came, you see. It was, it was necessary that the people of God be first separated and called out of this world from an unholy thing and to be made, to be made holy. In the beginning, uh, God told people, He told the Israelites simply uh, to be holy. He told them to separate themselves from the unclean thing. And, but now, uh, we are holy, and we've been separated by virtue of holiness. Those who have been made holy, but refuse to come out, if this is even possible, it throws up a big question question mark about their whole profession you see how did the people of God become holy and sanctified God called for it Amen. see it was God's purpose yeah. uh, that's the short answer that God called for sanctification mm -hmm. and separation unto holiness it's just like God calls for everything mm -hmm. he's called for separation unto holiness and his word, you see, will not come to him for it. will actually accomplish Amen. that what he wants to do. And this is the ground for, uh, for the commission that Paul was given in Acts 26. 
to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So it's sanctified, sanctified by faith as ye have been called unto holiness. For it is God who has chosen them unto sanctification. In this one verse, we have God calling men to be saints. And we have men calling, in return, we have men calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is men who are responding to God's call. You see, that, that's this word, his effective word. No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Now from the very outset, Paul has established that those who have come to God have come because God called. Because God called them. As he says in this text, called to be saints particularly. And furthermore, sanctification, we see it's not an arbitrary work of God, but it was something that was per precisely accomplished in Christ Jesus. It was a particular thing. So the calling of God is not a random call. You know, sometimes it's just refreshing just to stop and consider yeah. this, just to hold up a minute and just consider and rehearse uh, some central truths that uh, and it kind of reaffirm them in our own mind and, and, and in our own conscience that this world and all the decisions that has been made has been, has been made pertaining to God's desire and to His purpose. Yes. All the ordering and all the arrangements, has, it was done by God. All the plans that were made uh, uh, and, and how this, the world would uh, run and, and the management and all this, this was decided by God long time ago before the world was even created. Right. Before the foundations of the world were laid, God made these critical decisions about what would happen. So we can take great comfort in knowing that God didn't consult with anyone either. He made this in the counsel of His own will. He made these decisions. And it was all according to his own purpose. This is a central truth right. that we can, we can ground ourselves in. He decided everything then. So again, who are they? Who are the holy Thank you. Who are the holy ones of God? Paul states this in the very beginning. He does this not only so that the hearers would hear it brand or, or fresh, it'd be fresh in our minds again, but in a way, Paul has sanctified this whole letter by doing this. Can you see how that Paul has done this? He sanctifies his whole letter. And, he's, he, and it sanctifies Paul's efforts. And it's God honoring. You see, for Paul to, to start out from this position. The thrust of Paul is never far away. From God as the Father and Jesus Christ as, as the one who represents the Father and the Spirit working in men. So, so when Paul writes in this manner, the hearts of sensitive brethren... They will be awakened to the remembrance of God's calling in, in this particular instance. As it was a calling. Now remember, this was a calling under separation to holiness. That's what they'll remember. They'll recall responding in the name of the Lord. So when God calls, you see, He's, he's, he's going into action, isn't He? So when, when God calls, you, you can say, well, uh, he, something is happening. Um, he is the subject. In sanctification, brethren, we are, we are the object. Now, when God is calling, He's doing something. Mm -hmm. He's either making or creating some condition. He's doing something. The point is that God calls for sanctification in Christ Jesus. He has made His people holy through Jesus Christ. Now, since He has done this, you see, Paul will later establish that it's our job then to be holy. You to st stay holy, stay that way. Amen. You know, I, I reflected upon this that, you know, when I was a kid, we, uh, we were getting ready to go somewhere. We all came in and we got cleaned up. And we took turns in doing this and we, then we had to wait. A lot of times we'd ask mom, can we go back out? Can we go outside and play? You know, she'd say yes, but we, we already understood, but don't get dirty, you see. And but we already knew this anyway, but she reminded go outside, but don't get dirty. Now, if we, if, we came, if we went outside and played, and we came back in, and we was all dirty, then Daddy got involved. And, and, then, but, and he didn't act very nice about it, you see. But this is an illustration, brethren, how that now, you know, Paul is 
Paul has started out in this, in this position here that you know, we've been called and we've been sanctified and separated in Jesus Christ. And, and, and He intends, God intends for us to stay this way. God has made us holy. You see those? So then we don't want to go out and get dirty again. Yeah. Now, Adam and Eve, they, they didn't listen. Mm -hmm. We know. Uh, one time, they didn't listen. One time, and they had to leave. They had to leave the garden. Mm -hmm. And that's the facts in this matter. Now, the, the answer to uh, who are those? The holy ones of God. Well, Paul said, with all of that in every place that call upon the name of the Lord. So it's, it's just not a word to the Corinthians alone. It's to all the brethren yeah. in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, the reason I spent so much time on this point is because Paul did, you mm -hmm. see. Four times in his one verse, he made a reference to this. Mm -hmm. Church of God, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul labors with, and he labors for the saints, so that they may, they may increase in the knowledge of God, you see. And because and they've been called into Christ Jesus in the knowledge of the one uh, who has called them. Paul knows that as long as the brethren, as long as the brethren will understand that they're saints, and they, they stay in an unlearned place and they're unaware of salvation, they'll continue to be vulnerable yeah. to the efforts of Satan Amen. and the wickedness desire to reclaim them. Uh, the newborn of Christ in particular, they have two assaults coming at them. They have the old nature, the old Adamic nature, and then they have Satan, you see. Both two separate personalities can work very close together, you see. That's Satan's inroad back in uh, to a person would be the flesh. So you know that, that you got this. You got this uh, thing that uh, Paul is trying to guard against. It's the desire of Satan, brother, to discredit God, yeah. and he can do this when he causes when he causes the saints to falter, and to doubt, and make no progress and regress. You see, uh, to them that are sanctified, to those that are made holy. Now I know you understand that Paul is. He is, he is not exhorting the brethren to be holy necessarily, but he's reminding them of the state into which they've been called. You know this. But he, he wants to make this point clear again, that and a, a reminder that union with Christ has brought them into a, a state of sanctification and a state of separation unto holiness. Uh, this is meant to be a wake-up call for them, isn't it? And uh, Am I living this way before God? The scriptures are very plain. The people of God have been called out of this world. We're, we're talking about called away from the influence of this world in particular. From the influence of a world which is, we understand, we know it's wicked and evil. Now one day God is returning. It's an appointed day. Then the saints will be removed from the world. Actually, the world will be removed, won't it? Amen. Precisely. It will be the world that will be removed. Right. And, but anyway, the, Paul's intention is that the saints to be ready in that day. And although our, stash, our flesh still pulls us to this world, we, we despise this pull. That's right. And it's in this way, brethren, that we're no longer attached to this world. And it's in this way we no longer belong to the world. This is how it can be said that the saints have been called out of the world because we're in conflict with it. We don't like that pull that back to the world all the time. To say we know we're no longer in this world, it, that kind of implies we belong to a different one, doesn't it? The saints are not part of this world, we, but we know to whom we do belong, don't we? In John 17, this is the point that Paul, uh, that our Lord made in His prayer. Jesus declared, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, and that He kept them. Now, that doesn't mean that they always had a place to stay and they never missed a meal. That's not what that means at all. But that Jesus was able to keep them from this world. He was able, he was able to keep them from the evil one. Now, He was able to keep them from the influence of Judas, too. You see, Judas was right there in the group with them all the time, every day. He had, Satan had access to the group through Judas, but, Judas, but Jesus kept them all this time. They had the devil right there with them, but Jesus kept them. Jesus kept them 
by the power of His Word. Jesus has power over the wicked domain. That's how He can do this. And He keeps those who is entrusted to His care. This is all a work of God. When we see Jesus at work, we're seeing God working. That's why no man has seen God at any time, only the begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He had declared Him. When Jesus came to men, there's a multiplicity of things He accomplished and He did. But this one thing of revealing the Father is an outstanding thing. If not, well, it's, you know, it's an outstanding thing. Jesus said, The Father loveth the Son and hath given Him all things in His hand. The Son can do nothing of Himself but what He see the Father do. For whatsoever He, uh, so he doeth, those also the Son likewise. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. I, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of Him, that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. I speak that which I have seen of my Father, for I have not spoken of myself. But the Father which sent me, He giveth me commandments, what I should say and what I should speak. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, He doeth the works. Now, what a tremendous amount of testimony from our Lord Himself concerning why He did and why He said the things He did. They come straight out of the mouth of God the Father and what Jesus had to say. And this is the foundation, brother, upon which all these things are built on the authority of the Godhead. Now, we want to pay special attention to the way that Jesus spoke and, and, and a special consideration he gave to the will of God. Jesus teaches us the manner in which we should consider God's will. He's careful how Jesus spoke. I should be too, shouldn't I? Amen. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God. He has seen the Father. So it would be expected of us to trust ourselves in the one who has seen the Father. Amen. Jesus said he has entrusted all things into my care. Jesus is in agreement with the Father, isn't He? Because they are exactly one. It is precisely God's intention that Jesus will keep them, the called out ones. When Satan asked to sift Peter, like we, Jesus kept him. We, we remember that account. It is the Lord who keeps us while we're in and out of the furnace. It's Jesus who keeps us, brethren. Any one of us can be in the furnace tomorrow. But the Lord can keep us. Jesus said the Father gave him, Jesus said the men the Father gave him were clean. They're clean. I cleaned them up. Sanctified them through your word. Your word is truth. Now if you were to ask Judas if he was a disciple of the Lord, he would probably tell you, Yes, I am. You know, but we know that's not true. Because we see the end of the matter. He was not a disciple of the Lord, even he even though he tagged along with the rest of the group. Jesus never, uh, Judas never did turn the world loose, did he? That's how Satan was able to access him. We know that. When God calls a man to leave this world, like he called Abraham to leave Ur, God does in fact mean for us to leave it all. Every bit of it. Which means all our interest and all our affections for it too. Jesus never really could say, we left all to follow thee. For this has everything to do with crucifying the flesh and mortifying the deeds of the body, leaving this world. It is God's intention that this void, you see, created by the absence of the world, mm -hmm. it's His intention that it be filled with the pursuit of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Amen. God. And He's given us this new creation yeah. who has the capacity to obtain these things. Mm -hmm. That's why God has given Him to us. In John 17, Jesus did not ask, the Father removed disciples from the world, did He? No. But rather the Father would keep them mm -hmm. from the evil that is in this world. Jesus said, I pray for them. <laughs> Jesus didn't pray. I pray not for the world. Jesus didn't pray for the world yeah, at this right. time. Uh -huh. at, when Jesus was praying then, He didn't pray for the world. Yeah. But for them, yeah. which Thou hast given Me, I, for they are Thine. Yeah. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, Jesus is confirming to the Father in the hearing of the disciples they have been sanctified, called to be saints, you see. Jesus, He took 12 men, 
Subtract the one they call Judas. They had belonged to this defiled realm, just like all men. They had the same passions for this world, just like all of us, and He separated them unto holiness. And their union with Christ by faith, they themselves were made righteous. And though outwardly they looked just like all other men, when they went back to fishing, when Jesus, in that little interim time there, they looked just like all the other fishermen. But they were distinctly different. Their whole worldview was different. They had a different mindset. You could say they had a, a, a different world in mind completely. Disciples were being groomed for a world to come by Jesus. Jesus having taught them that this world would pass away. This world shall pass away, Jesus told them. Yeah, it was something they could relate to because it had already been spoken about. God had already said quite a, deal, a, 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 quite a bit about this already through the prophets. Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens, the work of thy... They shall perish. Mm -hmm. Several different places all over in Isaiah. The earth shall vanish like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, for the transgressions thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. God told Adam and Eve, Curse is the ground for your sake. Curse is the earth because of you. When God finished your creation, the scriptures say, when he saw everything he made, he said, Behold, it was very good. And yet this entire created realm was immediately defiled and cut off from God. Because of Adam's transgression, you see, it was cursed. Amen. This is a very arresting consideration when you consider the seen realm, how large it is. Even to this day, man has no idea how big it is. All of this is defiled and it's going to have to be removed. It's been cursed. It's been cursed to such a degree, God has told men, don't look at it. Don't look at it. Don't desire it. It has been defiled. It's been defiled. There's no cure for this defilement. God won't have it. It's scheduled for destruction. It's going to be removed. Just like men have to be made brand new again, so this whole creation will too. This defilement by sin and transgression, it just, just shows you how uh, the, seriousness, the seriousness of disobedience, doesn't it? Disobedience, it, it equals immediate defilement. And defilement, you know, we can reason in this way. Defilement is a state of being cut off from God. You can't associate with God. Unclean, unclean. We can cover our upper lip and cry unclean, unclean. We were just like the leopard who was required by law to stand at a distance and cover his upper lip. Unclean, unclean. Don't approach. I'm unclean. That's the way we were at one time. We were defiled in the sight of God. It's like those who had touched a, a dead body yeah. or one who had an abnormal body discharge in the, in the law. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were not to come in contact with that. It was mm -hmm. unclean, defiled by nature. We were that way. Mm -hmm. The world's under curse of sin. It has an abnormal discharge. Mm -hmm. And you know that the ceremonial, ceremonial law, uh, it was given to teach men the very serious nature of defilement. Why were those, uh, why, were, why were men told who were clean not to touch the unclean? Why were they told that? Why were the unclean forbidden to live with those who were clean? Why were they told them things? Well, because we know that the unclean contaminates the clean. That's right. And those things that are defiled, they're contagious. And they're spreadable to others. God is teaching us that disobedience of sin and rebellion defiles. And this defilement can defile others. Yeah. In Luke, we read this account. Jesus, he touched the coffin and said, I say unto you, young man, arise. And a young man rose up. And religious men, they comment on this and they say, they say, oh, Jesus, he, he touched the coffin. He touched a dead person. And he was himself still clean. He wasn't made unclean, you know. But then, you know, uh, I, I, I read that and I thought, you know, then look where Jesus is. You know, they, 
People have forgotten in the realm in which Jesus has come. The, the whole area into which he's come is a dead and unclean, unclean place. Yeah. That God had to give him a body, especially to come in this world that it was occupied by defilement and uncleanliness. Jesus came in. And he came in this world to bring life and, clean, and holiness. Now, Judas is not the only one in Scripture who professed the Lord but had a secret affections for this world. He's not the only one example. I mean, Jesus knew all about Judas. Nobody else in the group did. I mean, that's the way it is today. Jesus knows uh, those who love him and those who don't. Ananias and Sapphira, they were, they were a married uh, husband and wife team. They had, made the, they had a fellowship with the assembly there. They may have uh, aligned themselves in some way with them. And to some degree, they were active in the assembly. But the Spirit knew what they were up to. At some point, the two had become defiled, and they attempted to bring this defilement into the assembly. Peter was alerted to this, to them, and, and he confronted them about it. And he asked them, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? I want to know. Peter said, I want to know, how does Satan access you? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Maybe, maybe Peter probably already seen uh, some evidence or something, but nevertheless, the Spirit of God, He speaks loud and clear, doesn't it? Don't be living a lie and bring it into my assembly, you see, right there. And we may never know, you never know when the Spirit of God might meet you at the front door. You won't come, you can't come in today. You know, perhaps one of the most vivid illustrations we have, and, and uh, Brother Given brought this up the other night, is Achan. Now, he went out and done exactly what God told him not to do, right. didn't he? Now, uh, we, can, we can think, how did Achan go out and do something like that? Well, men do it every day, yeah. you know. But having brought that, what God called the accursed thing, right back into the assembly, it defiled Achan mm -hmm. and his brother. He buried it under the floor of his tent. Mm -hmm. And as you remember, the whole assembly, the whole, everybody was cut off from God. God could not be with them in that state of defilement. Defilement is really that big a deal. Amen. Matter of fact, it's so serious, defilement has to be removed. Right. I mean, the source of it has to be removed. Our nature was the source of our defilement, and praise God, He removed that, the power of it. It once dominated us, it no longer does, no more. What made us defiled has been removed out of the way, has been replaced with the righteousness of God. God has done all of this. He's explained it to us right here in the Scriptures. Jesus not only prayed for the salvation of the twelve, He also prayed for those who would believe on their word, their testimony of their word. Mm -hmm. And this prayer, brethren, was in full agreement with the purpose of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. For it was God's will to call out from every nation a people for Himself through the preaching of Jesus Christ. Jesus just didn't pray either. He just didn't pray he entered into the work. Jesus prayed and he worked. Those who are in the protection and care of the Lord, they'll never have to worry about Satan dragging them off into a place they don't want to go. Jesus protect them and care for them. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. We got this word. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and not and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Well, you know the word separate. It's an all-around word. What I mean is it can be used as an adjective. It can be used as a noun. It can be used as a verb. In all its different forms, it's used quite a bit in the Scriptures. God required the Israelites to be separate from other nations. But now in Christ Jesus... The people of God are indeed separate now. Now on the last day, separation will still be the issue, won't it? Yeah. It will be the one of the things that will define that day as the final day. There will be one final and distinct separation made. It says in the Scriptures, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the thr His throne Amen. of glory, and before Him shall be gathered all saints, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep 
on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, and on his right hand, that would be the sheep, He'd be speaking to them. Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen. Now, there's a whole lot more that can be said about defilement mm -hmm. than what I said tonight. But uh, the point is, God is not working in that place. He's working in that place where He's called the saints to be. Mm -hmm. So tonight, brethren, it's our, it's our desire to be found of God in, in holiness and in, in a clean place where he's brought us that we should be completely and totally separated mm -hmm. from the world and, and living in that way thank you brother Amen. Amen.